We've heard quite a lot about systemic racism recently in the news and in the media, and so hopefully we're going to get a chance to talk about why that's just not true at all. But we've also got a lot of different topics to get through, such as why white liberals hate themselves, whether Republicans can ever get the black vote, why everyone thinks that fascists are bad but communists are cool, how Republicans set themselves up to lose with the left's morality, all sorts of stuff. So be sure to watch all the way through. Watch it in parts if you have to, but it's going to be very epic, so do stay tuned. John Doyle in. Heck off, Kami. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off Kami. Got a lot to talk about today. Very important video, very important topics. Seems like we've been gone for a while, but... You know, that's just the cycle of things. I get stressed out about a bunch of stuff. I get depressed for a few days. And then I come back with a lot to say. And it usually makes for a pretty good video. So that's very epic. Might say some stuff that you like. Might say some stuff that you don't like. But you're at the very least going to want to watch all the way through. I would not steer you wrong. But uh, I thought that I should first announce the long-awaited and much-requested Heck Off Kami Discord server is just hours away from launching. It's probably up right now. We've got HOC's finest working on it. It's going to be available to members over at heckoffkami.com. So if you want to join the Discord, you want to talk to the boys and myself about politics. It's only $4, plus you get access to a bunch of other cool stuff like book recommendations and you get to vote on video topics, stuff like that, and it helps support the channel, which of course is very epic. Uh, we've also been doing Zoom call lotteries for members where basically a bunch of us just hop into a Zoom call and talk about stuff because we got to stick together. Got to take care of each other because uh, no one else will. So that's epic. But yeah, I wanted to talk about race in America today, about the politics of racism, things of that nature. And these are things that are considered to be controversial by people online who aren't actually living in the real world or who just want to like clutch their pearls at everything you say to try to make you look bad or look like a bigot, maybe get you deplatformed in the process. But I actually had a conversation like this at a grad party a few Sundays ago with a young lady who is very liberal, very far left. And I never drink. I don't like drinking, but I'll do it if I know it's going to be funny. Like if I'm going to drink it's going to be to the point where it becomes someone else's problem. So at the time I was like, yeah, let's get wasted and bring up Black Lives Matter to the drunk white girls who have been spamming social media uh, to end racism for the last two months. And for some reason, I can actually articulate myself better and at a faster rate when I'm drunk. I don't know why. But anyway, so I'm talking to this girl for like an hour and it concluded with her saying, you know, I'm too messed up to have this conversation right now, but I just want to say that I agree with like 90% of what you just said, and I'm sorry for misjudging you. And then proxy cameraman Matrix just stands up. He's like, the final red pill. John is reasonable. And I just thought that was very funny. But I also think the whole conversation is pretty emblematic of where we are as a country because the people who are the most invested in these narratives, whether it's Black Lives Matter or whatever the civil rights movement of the week is, these people are always incredibly emotional. They are visibly invested emotionally into these things. And those who are inclined to agree with these narratives might mistake that investment as passion. And I'm sure that there are a lot of very passionate people fighting on behalf of these narratives. But really what it comes down to is that these people are hurting on the inside, completely irrespective of the problems which these narratives supposedly seek to solve. It's not a coincidence that these people will attack you, ostracize you, just act viciously towards you. But then if you get them a little drunk, you find out that they're deeply insecure about themselves. They feel as though their lives have no meaning, etc. And that's one of the cores of liberalism. That is one of the largest predictors of a person identifying as left wing, which is their level of insecurity. If you're insecure about yourself, you have a negative perception of yourself, maybe rightfully so. You know that you're not going to fare as well in a competitive system compared to someone who's confident and capable, but you still have an instinct to survive and to achieve what you believe is the best case scenario for yourself, whatever that may be. And so that would compel you to gravitate towards something like a system that can supposedly ensure equality and egalitarianism. And on top of that, it's a matter of identifying with struggle. What really really woke me up to this was seeing one of my friends, a tweet from one of my friends a couple years ago. This guy was never really into politics at all, but he did have some self-esteem issues since he didn't really have any goals or interests or anything like that. He was out of shape. Uh, and one day I saw him reply to a tweet talking about, you know, the families being separated at the southern border. And he said something like the people replying to this saying that it's a good thing have never had to face any legitimate struggle in their lives. And it, it clicked. It's like, that's what it is. These people are projecting their internal struggles and insecurities onto these movements because they believe that they understand the struggle that these groups believe that they're facing and because it gives them a sense of purpose in their lives. And we know that left-wing people already have much higher rates of mental illness than do right-wing people, but human beings gravitate towards struggle. We need something to fight for. We need something to conquer. And when you've had everything handed to you, 
You almost have to create your own struggle by convincing yourself that you're part of like freaking Dumbledore's army, but you're not. You're not part of Dumbledore's army. That's why there's so many rich white kids out there doing this, especially the affluent white liberal females, the dregs of society, the single greatest destructive force in the history of global politics. Because on the one end, you've got Black Lives Matter. And it's a lot easier for Black Lives Matter and a lot more profitable for them to come out and say, hey, uh, these issues that we're dealing with have nothing to do with choices that are made by black Americans. And it actually, it has everything to do with white people and white people being racist. And if you disagree, it's because you're racist. Oh, and by the way, asserting that problems facing black Americans are largely the result of choices made by black Americans is less rude than asserting that they are caused by an entire race of people because they're racist or even less human. In other words, if I'm a dick for saying that the reason black men are more likely to go to prison than white men is because they're more likely to commit violent crimes, then you're an even bigger dick for saying it's actually just because white people are all racist. But anyways, so on the one end, you have Black Lives Matter, and they can make a lot more money and get a lot more power, because remember, they're Marxists, by completely and totally absolving black Americans from any responsibility for their actions, and instead placing the blame on white people, America, and police officers. And then on the other hand, you have people such as the white liberal women and the soy boys going along with the narrative because they have no meaning in their lives, and they're insecure, and they want a community that they believe can resonate with their self-perceived struggle. That is why women and weak feminine men are the most likely to virtue signal. If you are physically weak, you're high in agreeableness, uh, then you need people to like you because if they don't like you, they're just going to walk all over you. And so they pathologically virtue signal so as to advertise themselves as the most noble, most virtuous people in society, literally as this sort of like quasi survival instinct to try to put themselves in the most optimal position possible. And so the reason I bring this up is because someone like me or you would have a very difficult time having an honest conversation with these people because they don't want to leave their mobs and because any concession on their part would require a consideration of the fact that they're not actually that virtuous and what they're doing isn't actually that groundbreaking, let alone making any progress towards actually solving the problems. You would literally have to get one of these people one-on-one -on -one and probably a little bit drunk for them to really tell you what's on their mind. Virtually everything else is just public display. And that's actually pretty dangerous for people like you and me because uh, when you are that emotionally invested into something because your entire sense of self is derived from it, you're not looking at the opposition as a human being who just happens to disagree with you. You're looking at them and everything that surrounds them as an enemy that has to be leveled and buried. And we are just now starting to see how dangerous that actually is. And I don't think it's going away anytime soon, unfortunately. And that's why one of the things I've been saying recently is conservatives really need to get away from this whole, wow, look at these crazy liberals, haha, <laughs> so triggered, ha, <laughs> it's just a political disagreement, what, you don't want to sit down and have a conversation with me? You don't want to have a dialogue with me? No, no they don't. The ones in your neighborhood want you off their social media friends lists, and the ones out there rioting in major cities want you dead. Do not think for a second that they will let someone like you or someone like me live in their utopian society, so... It might be time to stop sharing infographics on Facebook.com about how many people have been killed by communist regimes and realize that you would be in that statistic. But it's not going to be the government that kills you. It's going to be mobs of people. They're going to show up at your home. You're going to try your best to pick off a few with your AR-15, your $1,200 AR-15 that you customized and built yourself. But at the end of the day, you are going to be killed and the media will ignore it and the police won't be there to help you and the government will do absolutely nothing about it. And I thought that we'd get into this a little bit later, but it fits better now, which is that whenever conservatives are discussing who's really the end me whenever we talk about hey you know off the record what's really going on here who's really in charge we still only identify the enemy within the approved frame like i get emails every day from well-intentioned people with links to these forms talking about how world war ii never ended john the nazis have taken over the u.s government or john wake up look look at antifa they're fascists and it's like i get that i get what you're saying i don't like nazis i don't like fascists they don't like me but if we were really fighting those guys we'd have no idea about it you know what I mean? Like, my grandpa served alongside General Patton in World War II, which is something I'm very proud of. So by the time I was three years old, I could tell you that the Nazis are the bad guys. By the time any American leaves middle school, they can tell you that the Nazis are bad and that fascism is bad. And of course, that's true. But it really makes you wonder why we aren't taught the same about communists. Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong, Pol Pot, Fidel Castro, or any one of these figures who have killed millions upon millions more than Nazis or fascists. And I have to stress, this is not a defense of those, obviously. The point is that for whatever reason, 
We're taught that Nazis and fascists are the worst things ever because of mass murder and unprecedented and incomprehensible human rights violations. But we learned virtually nothing about the same and even vastly worse crimes coming from communists. And the reason for that is that two of the biggest features of fascism were that it was opposed to communism and that it was nationalist. And so for conservatives such as myself who are opposed to communism and who believe that America should put the interests of her people first, well, now we can be accused of being fascists. And we've already learned that the worst thing that you can be is a fascist. And so if you're a communist, you're in a nice little position now because no one knows anything about you or your history and things that would make it harder for you to succeed, such as an opposition to communism, or a love of America can now be labeled as fascism. And we all know that fascism is bad, but communism isn't. In fact, it sounds rather nice. A society where everyone is equal, state enforced equality. Wait, duh, that seems so obvious. Why didn't we think of that right off the bat? And that's why I hate the term radical left. Trump and a lot of other conservative figures have used this term a lot. Uh, and that term needs to be emphasized as a modifier. Like we need to emphasize that we're not talking about the radical left as separate from the rest of the left. We need to emphasize that the left in general has gone completely radical. And notice how no one cares. Far right, <gasps> right wing extremist. <gasps> but on the left, nobody panics because it's all part of the plan. Show me someone on the left who has disavowed the rioting and the destruction, anyone in politics or the media, show me one. And the reason you can't show me one is because they're perfectly fine with it. Maybe they don't want to be the ones out there on the front lines getting tear gassed or beating people half to death, but they agree with the ends and so the means are justified. That's why liberals like Dave Rubin, Elon Musk, and Joe Rogan are being adopted by the right as figures. They're liberals who have rejected the radicalization of the left, but they're still liberals fundamentally, which just goes to show how far things have gone in this country like towards the left. And that's why this whole strategy on the right of, well, Antifa are the real fascists or the left is using Nazi tactics is so utterly self-defeating because you're agreeing with their moral framework. You're accepting their TOS. You're agreeing with them that the worst thing ever is fascism, which they only spread because it distracts people from what they're doing. And it makes you a normal conservative seem like a Nazi. And then you think you can like beat them at their own game. Do you think that you can go to Portland and tell the people torching the city? Well, you know, you guys are actually acting quite a lot like Mussolini's black shirts. Maybe if you sat down with me over some coffee, we could. No, they wouldn't listen to you. They wouldn't learn anything. You would learn what it's like to have your ribs cracked by a dozen different pairs of feet. But these aren't fascist tactics. These are communist tactics. How do I know? Because the communists did the same thing and because these people are communists or are acting on behalf of communists. To co-opt their language and their framework is to accept defeat. You are agreeing with their morality. And the problem with that is that their morality does not include your intrinsic value or dignity. They don't have an unconditional view of humanity. Just look at their attitudes towards abortion. They believe that in order for a human being to achieve personhood, it isn't enough that they are a human being or that they're alive. They have to meet certain arbitrary criteria, whether it be sentience or viability, etc. And what that means is that being a human and being alive is not enough to afford you your God-given human rights, especially because they don't believe in God or objective morality. And so basically what it comes down to is a subjective view of human value where those in power decide whether those not in power get to live based on what is convenient to maintaining their status. And we see this when they support a mother's decision to slaughter her child four weeks before he's born, since his existence is an inconvenience, or when past regimes have slaughtered the political opposition because their existence was inconvenient. It's all the same. And the only thing preventing you from ending up in an anonymous pile of bones is that they don't have power yet, but they're getting there. So the point is that we have to abandon their moral framework, which has taught us uh, from infancy through their control of education and media. We have to stop calling them the real fascists and start calling them what they are, which is militant anti-white communists. Who are the real fascists? No one. But these people are working on behalf of something with a much worse and more evil record than fascism. And they have a lot of power and they're getting more of it every year. And again, this is not a defense of fascism. The point of this is that the whole reason we have to focus on fascism is so people like me and you look bad when we stress the importance of things like uh, putting America first or opposition to communism. And that's why I even have to clarify this in the first place. But a couple more important things to note about the conservative moral strategy. Uh, we're going to get into racism in a, as a political strategy in just a second. But a really great example between how the left uses morality versus how the right uses morality is the difference between their branding and their advertising. And this was a point made recently by my friend Darren Beatty during a podcast with Chris Buskirk of American Greatness, which you should listen to. But anyways, the point is uh, one of the quintessential emblems of the American right is the Gadsden flag, the famous don't tread on me flag. Uh, many of us probably have had one hanging on display at some point or another. And what that flag means is, of course, leave me alone. I come in peace, basically. Uh, it's dating back to the American Revolution and the coiled rattlesnake represents a willingness to defend oneself if necessary. It's basically saying, I don't want to attack you, but if you attack me, then, you know, I'm going to hit you back. Like if you were to step on a rattlesnake and get bitten as a result. Now, 
What we found out as conservatives is that if you wait until you get stepped on to fight for your country and preserve everything that made it great, you'll end up fighting back at a total disadvantage because you've been crushed with the weight of 70 years of policy that is antithetical to your values. Virtually the entire media and academic establishment and the vast majority of corporate America and the ruling class. And now you're standing up, you're brushing yourself off like, oh, you shouldn't have done that. You just made yourself a big mistake there, pal. No, 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 they didn't. You did. You made the mistake. You were unresponsive while they took your country away from you because you were operating under the insane assumption that something as great as America could be preserved with a handshake. You were a mighty rattlesnake. You were the best in the world. And you watched them begin to dismantle your country. And you said, hey, knock it off or else I'll bite you. And they were like, hmm, let's equip ourselves a bit better before we go all out. And so now what's happening is they control literally all of the relevant infrastructure in the country, and you, the rattlesnake, are just waking up to this, but before you can even get yourself in striking position, they just come at you with a 10-foot tree pruner and just cut your stupid rattlesnake head off. You're no longer a threat to them. Now you compare this to the recent branding on the left uh, and the moral imperialism that they have. They've been saying things like, white silence is violence. And what that statement means is, if you don't fight alongside us, you're bad, and you are the enemy. It is akin to violence. And if you look at this purely from a uh, the perspective of rhetorical strategy, which is something that the left is vastly better at doing than the right, it's a powerful message because it asserts itself. It's saying this is correct. It is imperative that you not only agree, but that you also support us because otherwise you're a bad person and you're complicit in violence. And so when you compare that to something like, hey, just don't tread on me. Do whatever you want, man. It's all good. Just don't tread on me. You know, do whatever, though. It's, it's easy to see why the left wins. You look at what's happening in your country. You know it's wrong. Maybe you're not too sure about things like fiscal policy or foreign policy, but you know that you are correct on American exceptionalism, on the realities of biology, on the value of human life, the importance of preserving the innocence of children, the importance of preserving America, which means preserving its culture and its heritage. You know that. These are not up for debate. They're the very foundation of our country and of our way of life. And given that, you have to defend them with the same aggression and drive that the left is using to destroy them. No more watching Fox News and making jokes about, well, this is what happens when everyone gets a participation trophy. No, you actually have to be active now. We don't have time for anything else anymore. You have to defend America with the same energy, drive, and confidence that the left is using to destroy it. Otherwise, we lose. That's why we've been losing. We know that we're correct, but being correct isn't enough. You actually have to fight. No more, don't tread on me. We're replacing that with, actually, I will tread on you. As a matter of fact, I think I will tread on you because you've been treading on us for decades now, and I'm not exactly a fan of channel surfing between, hey, look, we're abusing children, but it's colorful and we're zany, so it's okay, and this just in, people who hate America burn down more great American cities and destroy more tributes to great American heroes. No one has done a thing about it. Now, back to Trump is bad, the show. We need to practice moral imperialism. Not don't tread on me, but abortion is murder. Not don't tread on me, but drag queen story hour is child abuse, etc. You get the point. It's not like we're just arbitrarily deciding morality and enforcing that. It's not our morality. It's objective morality as defined by God. And that's the fundamental difference. We're serving God and they're serving themselves. They are militant anti-white communists. And that's the other thing. This is something I know we're all curious about because it affects a lot of us. But for some reason, very few people on the right will talk about this. And that is the question of why does the left hate white people? Why do they hate white people? And I'm not interested in proving to you that these people hate white people. If you don't understand that by now, then you should open your eyes. They're calling for all white people to be killed. They're saying that all white people are inherently racist. They're saying that white people are subhuman. They're teaching their children to not trust white children. They're saying that we should kill ourselves. They're saying that you're a literal plague on the earth. And in case you couldn't tell, this is not rhetoric that is characteristic of good intentions. This is not rhetoric that suggests a longing for peace and equality and coexistence. They hate you and it's because you're white. And you might be wondering like, why would the left hate me because I'm white? Most of the radical leftists are white too. Well, like, wouldn't that mean that they'd hate themselves? Yeah, that's exactly what that would mean. And that is exactly the case. Let's wind the clocks back to what we were talking about earlier. What causes people to be leftists? Self-loathing, which leads them to hate other white people as well. We know that liberals are more willing to murder someone for the greater good if that person has a white sounding name rather than a black sounding one. We know that they believe that it is more plausible that black people are genetically superior to white people with regards to intelligence than would be the reverse case. We know that they believe non-white people should not have to pay more for home insurance due to living in a high risk area, but are neutral about whether white people should. And we know that they would support censoring research showing that white people are more intelligent, more than they would support censoring research showing the same of black people. And we know that they are the only group 
white liberals are the only group who on the net prefer other racial groups to their own. And that's talking about in-group bias, which is something that we all have. It doesn't mean that we're bad people. It's just that we tend to have a bias towards people who look like us. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to act on that bias. I mean, there's even research that shows that you can develop in-group favoritism between groups of people by assigning them to different groups based on something as arbitrary as a coin toss. So it's pretty easy to make people get territorial and tribal like this. And statistically speaking, black people have the strongest in-group bias, followed by Asian people, Hispanic people, and then finally non-liberal white people. And then liberal white people actually have a net negative in-group bias, which means they literally have a bias against themselves because of who they are. And because the bias is so strong and contrary to what we'd expect and what is demonstrated by literally every other group of people, it's evident that white liberals seriously resent themselves and it's because of who they are. It's because they're white people. Maybe that's why they've also been found uh, to show less sympathy towards poor white people after hearing leftist rhetoric about white privilege while the sympathy towards poor black people stays the same. They have a bias against themselves, which we would typically just label as low self-esteem, which would also make sense because liberals have much lower self-esteem than do conservatives. And you can even shift people's political beliefs to the right by raising their self-esteem before giving them a political opinions quiz. So yeah, it makes sense given that what we know uh, about them, like they basically hate themselves. They're more than willing to sell themselves out for whatever characteristic of themselves is currently on the chopping block. Oh, we hate America now? Well, I'm from America. I'm the worst. Oh, we hate white people now? Well, I'm white. I'm the worst, etc. And there's also evidence to suggest that white guilt or making people feel as though they've been given an unfair advantage over other people is psychologically damaging, even after controlling for age, sex, income, education, marital status, and also that it has increased over time as we put our children through schools and curriculums that have taught them to hate themselves. So we've got that established. Now we have to ask ourselves, given that the anti-white narrative is well underway, and given that so many white people are being taught to hate themselves for being white, uh, and so many of them already do, like, we have to ask, what does this achieve? Like, what is the purpose of doing all this? What is to be gained by demonizing white people? Well, think about what the ultimate goal is first. The ultimate goal is to completely destroy America as we know it or as we knew it and transform it into a dystopian socialist country where those in charge have everything and all the power and everyone else has nothing. But before they can do that, they have to erode the foundations of this country, which have been there since the beginning, and in some cases even before the beginning. And they were put there by very smart and very strong and very good men, and they were intended to be preserved by future generations of those same meant. And so fundamentally what it comes down to is of those who built the country and of those who have the deepest roots in the country, the vast majority are white people. This is not a controversial statement. This is just the reality of American history. So to answer why do they hate white people, it's because the people who have the greatest incentive to preserve our country are going to be the people who have the deepest roots here. And this doesn't mean that people whose parents came here 40 years ago can't love America or that they don't want to preserve America. It just means that because of the history of the country, the vast majority of the deepest roots in this country are going to be those of white people. And that's just because, historically speaking, this country was basically biracial. We were never diverse like the left claims. We had Northern European white people and we had West African black people. But there were lots more white people than there were black people. And so the strongest force that these militant communists will face is going to be the force of the roots which are buried the deepest in American soil. And the majority of those are the roots of white people. And again, this doesn't mean that non-white people can't love America or that they don't want to preserve America or that their families haven't done so for generations. Of course, that's all true. It's just to say that if the left can successfully demonize an entire race of people, they won't even have to go after the patriots of other races because by that point, it'll be too late. Like they'll have so much power that they can just completely crush their opposition. So when I see some of these students coming to attend American universities from other countries and they're talking about how evil America is, how America has to apologize for doing things less evil than their country or most other countries, about how, oh, America has to be more like my country. And it's like they've been here an entire semester or maybe even an entire undergraduate education. And I think introspectively about how my roots go back in this country hundreds of years, the things that those people fought and died for and, and built to be passed on to future generations, including myself, not to be taken for granted, how my bloodline has been within a 250 mile radius of where I am right now since 1659. And it's like, yeah, over my dead body. But that's what the strategy is behind white hatred and behind racism in general. Racism doesn't exist in contemporary America as much else than a political strategy. We're taught from infancy that we're racist or that our country is racist. Its institutions are racist. Its history is racist. How do we fix it? We don't. We replace it with something more progressive, more 21st century, with something more committed to equality and egalitarianism. This is all despite the fact that, legally speaking, the least privileged group of people in this country are straight, white, Christian, conservative men. 
me and you, big guy, the forgotten gamers of America. But none of that matters because their fixation on racism is not out of a commitment to justice. It's out of a commitment to victory and domination. If they actually cared about racism, uh, they'd call out the overwhelming amount of anti-white racism that we see every day in our media and that we hear every day in our classrooms, but they don't because they actually endorse it themselves. And so conservatives need to understand that racist is not a real word with a real meaning. Racist just means shut up. That's all it means, virtually nothing more. But what conservatives like to do, because we've lost so much in the last few decades that we get excited by even the smallest potential victories. So when someone calls us a racist, we go, now wait just a minute, I'm a racist, all right? Why is that? Provide some evidence for your claim. And you've got this smug little look on your face because, oh, you think you're winning. Or, or you know, if, if they'll insult you, uh, you'll say, well, if you're insulting me, it's because you can't beat me. It's like, except they are. They are beating you. And they've been beating you. And why is that? Because, well, you've ceded ground to them. You've accepted their moral framework because you think that you can outfox them within it, but you can't. The response to someone calling you a racist is not to debate them on whether or not you're a racist because the second you do that, you lose. The conversation has been totally derailed. The correct response is to tell them to F off and to go about your business. You're never going to convince these people that you're not racist. You are wasting your time because you're agreeing with them that being racist is something that is a serious problem in American society. You're dignifying what they've said to you with a response. And that's idiotic. The same thing with the predominant conservative strategy now, which is to point out that the Democrats are the real racists. There was a resolution introduced into Congress recently to ban the Democrat Party because it's history of supporting slavery, because the Democrats are the real racists. And yet again, Republicans are too stupid to understand that they're committing suicide. They're playing right into the left's hand and moral framework, and they think that they're going to win, but they lose every time. Do you think anybody gives a crap what you're telling them about the Democratic Party of the 19th or even 20th century? That was decades ago. They don't like you because they think you're racist now, and nothing is going to change that. They're not looking at it like, who did this to me? The Republicans? or the Democrats. They're looking at it like, oh, it was white people. And the left and the media and the universities affirm that like, yeah, it was white people. And the conservative response is to go, yes, but more specifically, it was the Democrats. <laughs> they don't care. No one cares. That racist country that they're trying to fundamentally decompose is being handed off by the radical left politicians and by the media and by the universities. And your response is, well, at least it's the Democrats that screwed it up in the first place and made them hate it. It doesn't matter. You doorknob. The end results are the same. Stop reciting recycling old leftist talking points because you think it's going to win you the black vote. Have a seat for this one. It's not pretty. The Republican Party is never going to win the black vote. It's impossible. This is very simply because since black people exist as a minority group in this country, they have emphasized group solidarity in party politics so as to leverage their political strength. This party loyalty is what's referred to as racialized social constraint, uh, which is basically that support for the Democratic Party has come to be defined as a norm of group behavior. Uh, or in other words, it's just something that is expected of you as a black person, uh, and it's meant to empower the group as a whole. And I have lots of black conservatives in the audience who I know can speak to this, that voting Democrat is just something that you're expected to do as a black American and something that can get you ostracized if you don't do it. We all know that black Americans overwhelmingly vote for Democrats, but what you might not know is that even black Republicans don't vote for Republicans that often. In every presidential election between 1968 and 2012, black Republicans only voted majority Republican in half of them. Studies have shown that running black candidates as Republicans has basically no effect on getting black Americans to vote for Republicans, um, and even that blacks who self-identify as Republican only vote for Republicans about 12% of the time. Uh, also, black attitudes towards things like gay marriage and abortion were not predictive of black voting, which is interesting because black Americans are very religious people. Um, but with the data that we have available, uh, if you wanted to get the probability of a black American voting Republican to be over 50%, you would have to look at black Americans who self-identify as Republicans and who also self-identify as evangelical Christians and then who also supported the, uh, the war in Iraq. And then even then, it's only 65% voting Republican. So what does this mean? It means that for the time being, Republicans are never going to get the black vote. It's just like virtually impossible. And the reason for that is that there is a pervasive and poisonous cultural narrative within black America that says racism and oppression are the reasons for discrepancies. And the Democrats are more than happy to go along with that for political power. But of course, they don't actually care about black Americans. We know that. But... It doesn't matter because now conservatives are in a tough position because to address and agree with that cultural narrative would be false. But it's also difficult to sell anything else, especially considering how successful Democrats have been. And so Republicans foolishly believe that they can beat the Democrats at their own game by saying, hey, guess what? 
Democrats are the real racists. It will never work. If you want to bring black Americans to the Republican Party, you can't do it by playing a worse version of what the Democrats are doing. Like you have to restore order to their neighborhoods. You have to put their families before the families of non-Americans. And you have to emphasize how gay the Democrats have made everything, for lack of a better phrase. Like that would be a step in the right direction. But again, even stemming back to block voting as a strategy for leveraging group political power, you're talking about something that is just not realistic. And it's not like I don't care about black people, so I'm just going to dismiss these problems. It's more like I do care about black people, and I think that what you're doing as the left is not only failing to solve any problems, I think it's also making them worse, and I'm suspect of your political aspirations given the radical policy prescriptions which you've proposed. This is said because we actually want to solve the problem. We have to identify the problem first, though. And when you pander to black Americans with the left's narrative that you know is complete BS, you're not actually earning their vote with anything compelling. You don't deserve it either. In 2012, Mitt Romney got 27% of the Hispanic vote. Hispanics are the largest minority group in America. They make up about 18% of the population. Mitt Romney got 27% of them to vote for him. Here's an interesting fact. If Mitt Romney had gotten 71% of the Hispanic vote instead of just 27%, he still would have lost. But that being said, guess how many more percentage points of white voters he would have needed to win? 4%. The point of all this being that until we can figure out an actual strategy for appealing to these different groups of people, instead of just doing stupider and more dishonest versions of what the left is doing, we should probably focus on maintaining support with white voters. And then once we get into positions of power and we start to get things on the right track again, then we can figure out other strategies because it doesn't matter if the truth is on your side. If you don't control the media or the universities, which you don't, by the way, then you're not going to win. And if and when we take those institutions back, we can start spreading things like that about our enemies to make sure that they never hold power again. Because that's exactly what they're doing to us. But the difference is that the things that we will be saying are true. Then and only then can we begin tarnishing the history of the Democrats. Can we begin consolidating control of the blackmail tapes? Relaxed. You get the idea. But even then, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier uh, with the inability to view the enemy through a lens other than the one provided by the left, who aren't our friends. Like I mentioned, uh, that immigrant labor harms black Americans. And it's true that after Jim Crow ended, blacks were never really given a chance to succeed because of the 65 Immigration Act, and it was harder for them to find jobs that would pay relatively well. But you can't view that through that lens because your PP gets hard thinking about, well, people coming to America because they love it and they want to work hard. And it's like, yeah, maybe, but we've known for decades that immigrant labor disproportionately harms black Americans, but you'd rather tell me, John, it was the Democrat Party and Lyndon B. Johnson's Great Society programs, John. Do you know what he said about black voters? It would disgust you. And maybe after I'm done telling you about that, I can tell you about who really founded the KKK. And it's like, please, please, please stop. I know you think you're helping, but you're not. You can't beat them at their own game. You are the poor American teenager walking into the jungles of Vietnam, and they are the Viet Cong who are going to tear you apart. You don't know this game. You don't know its rules. You will never win. Turn around and regroup. Otherwise, you're just burning resources. The unfortunate reality of our situation is that identity politics is inevitable. We are living in a multiracial, multicultural society with nothing substantive under which to unify, and as a result of that, identity politics are inevitable, especially because the left has realized how effective they are for consolidating and increasing political power. And that's wrong of them to do. But the problem that conservatives have is that we think that issues can be evaluated and, and, and weighed in the abstract without any regard for emotion or lived experiences. We think that everything should just boil down to facts and logic. But unfortunately, that's just a pipe dream. That's not how human beings work. We are emotionally driven beings. So yeah, it would be great if everyone could set aside their differences and look at things objectively with ink and paper, but that's just never going to happen. So conservatives need to figure out a way to coexist with that because right now we're trying to fight this, this consequence of human nature, while the left is running wild with it and just racking up points on us. Like the problem with Black Lives Matter, according to most basic conservatives would be, well, all lives matter, not just the black lives. That's missing the point. The real problem with Black Lives Matter is that virtually the entire narrative is a lie. The entire timeline from Trayvon to Michael Brown, hands up, don't shoot. It's all a lie. That's the problem. And if conservatives could take control of a narrative, they could communicate that better. But it goes back to the Gadsden flag versus silence is violence. As of now, conservatives don't exist to create narratives. We exist to basically react smugly to the narratives of the left, sometimes with facts and logic, as though this is an equivalent or even comparable strategy for winning people to our side. But it isn't. If you want to be against something, you also have to be for something. And right now, conservatives basically exist to be against the seductive collapse of our country, but they're not exactly offering up any alternative solutions. Uh, and, And unless that 
that changes, our future looks pretty gloomy. And the plan's not complicated. It was never complicated. It's not the Illuminati. It's not the Clintons. It's an elite ruling class who have unwaveringly imported the third world while offshoring manufacturing jobs so that they could hire cheap labor with the help of the bought and paid for Washington establishment. And not only do the politicians share in the profits off the mega corporations, they get to use the ever rewarding strength of diversity as political capital. They now have the opportunity to create and exploit group division for political influence and power. And all of this has led to the complete destabilization of society to the levels which we're approaching now. We talk a lot on this channel uh, about how the collapsed family structure has led to the destabilization of society, and that's part of it. But when you're living in a country with literally no unifying principles or heritage or culture or religion or language or even morality, the only thing left for you to do collectively is participate in the consumerist culture. But then even that becomes difficult because they're sending jobs overseas and bringing in millions of people to compete with American families for whatever's left. Like, See how that might be a problem? Conservatives got so excited and caught up in defending capitalism that we forgot to defend America. Because if you don't put America first and you sell her to the lowest bidder in this case, then she won't be America much longer. Who do you think pays for those economic studies to be written? Those studies that prove living in a post-industrial economy is actually good for the average American because we can buy orange juice for 20 cents less. It's all horse crap. There's no such thing as a post-industrial economy or society. Our jobs didn't just magically become information jobs or whatever. They just left. They just went away. They didn't all integrate into the information economy. They just disappeared. And the people who financed and made money from those decisions didn't care that towns throughout the heart of America were in the blast radius. The only reason that that information is so easily available and is taught to all of us throughout school seemingly is the only concession that they'll give to capitalism is because people paid for it to be there and they paid for it to be taught to you. The government is not your friend, but you know who else isn't your friend? Billionaires who use the government to hurt you for them so that they don't have to get blood on their Armani suits. Never forget that. We're getting off topic. See, now I've gone too far. Now they're going to kill me. But uh, I should have just said that everything can be traced back to the Clintons. That's the approved line for conservatives. And that's what was so funny to me about when Epstein died. Uh, and I did a video about well, I was trying to get people to understand that this whole thing is so much bigger than the Clintons and that they basically are irrelevant. And right on cue, I had people in the comments, no, it was the Clintons. And it's like, okay, cool. What are you going to do about it? You've got it all figured out. What's next? You look on late night television shows all over social media, literally everyone, including the mainstream celebrities, were making jokes about how Epstein didn't kill himself. The Clintons did it again, and everyone had a good laugh about it. And I remember tweeting at that time about it, and I said something like, I'm glad everyone's just now coming out to discuss the circumstances surrounding Epstein uh, now that it's a quirky little trend on social media. And it's like, you're going to make that joke and then you're going to go back to watching Parks and Recreation, right? Like you're going to post that and then you're going to be like, hey, honey, what's the Disney Plus password again? And it's just to show where we are as a society, how weak and pacified and impotent we are, that something like that could literally happen right in front of us. And the only thing that we can do is make it into a meme or even a holiday sweater so that everyone knows how topical and funny we are. The people who actually killed Epstein, and it wasn't the Clintons, they're not laughing with you when you say that. They're laughing at you because they know that they're untouchable and they know that you'll never do anything about it because you're too distracted. But anyways, see, now I'm really going to get hit. Uh, the point that I'm trying to make, or that I was trying to make, is that if you want to appeal to black Americans, then you have to appeal to black Americans. You know what I'm saying? Conservatives think that we can reject identity politics and still get black Americans to flip for us. But to believe that undermines the block voting strategy for political leverage that minority groups, and particularly black Americans, tend to practice. And that belief that we hold ignores the unique self-perceived identity of black Americans. And for the time being, if we ever wanted to flip black Americans for Republicans, it would require us to acknowledge that unique self-perceived identity amongst black Americans. When we have power for 60 years and we control the narratives, uh, then maybe we can get closer to viewing each other as just Americans, you know? But for the time being, we don't really have a choice with identity politics or things like it, because if we sit out, we keep singing the same old song that, that's led us to this point. Uh, we're just going to lose even harder and perhaps irreparably. And I, I know we said we were going to talk about systemic racism, but we've been going for a while. I don't know. I don't think I have it in me, to be honest. So if you've made it this far, thank you. I really appreciate you sticking around. We'll do it in the next video, the idea of systemic racism. We'll just go through it in detail. We'll just completely tear it to shreds and expose it for the lie that it is. But uh, it's still good that we talked about this stuff, you know? It's, it's important stuff. Hey guys, if you like this video, leave it a thumbs up, leave it a comment with your thoughts, subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications. Uh, what's the other one? Come on, big brain, big brain, fatigued brain, but still big brain. Uh, share a video with your friend. This video, specifically. Like, if you want to share a video with a friend, I suppose that's your prerogative, but specifically share this video uh, uh, w with a friend who, who is specifically yours. 
That's the one. That's your mission if you choose to accept it. Also, go to hackoffcommy.com. Sign up for a membership. Get the Discord. It's pretty epic, I would say. Um, Yeah, man. I'm beat. I sat down. I was like, I'll talk about systemic racism, too. I can talk about all these things. Nope, nope. Two-parter. Two-parter. But anyways, thank you so much for watching, and may God bless America.